So uh, this is the Where We Find Ourselves Coral Consortium. I'm gonna share my screen. So welcome to the Where We Find Ourselves Coral Commissioning Consortium. We are 29 strong right now. We have great groups. Actually, I'll share a screenshot of uh, one of the groups that met with myself and with Chantel, the lyricist. There they are, a beautiful group of, of uh, high school, uh, very smiley, happy high school kids in California with a very, very happy director, uh, Andy Eisenman, who is a joy to uh, you know, get to know and to talk with and his enthusiasm and his passion you know, for his kids is just um, very um, infectious. It's just wonderful. Uh, so, so we have a, a great group that's coming together in this. And I'm very, very excited um, about all 29 choirs. I've met with about four of them so far. Um, we have live Zoom sessions. Chantel and myself do a live Zoom session with every single choir that's part of the consortium. And I have to say, these are just fabulous um, groups. Um, any, any choir that is um, you know, adventurous enough to join our consortium um, in itself is a fabulous group. <laughs> uh, the song cycle where we find ourselves is actually five songs. Uh, it's very good bang for the buck for you choirs that like to commission um, composers. Um, this is 20 minutes worth of music, although of course, not every, let's put it this way, there are gonna be some choirs that'll program all of it, but um, they're welcome to just commission, or they're welcome to just perform, you know, program one of the movements, or maybe, you know, uh, perform one of the movements virtually this spring and then you know decide to uh to perform all five movements sometime next year when they're back live together um however they want to do it um they're uh, they are part of the commissioning consortium and they have um the uh permission um and the ownership of the piece to perform it however they like and whichever voicings they want so this is a, a commission that actually even though it says it's five songs, it, altogether I'm writing 20 pieces. There are five songs in the song cycle. There's going to be an SATB version. There's going to be an SAB version. There's going to be an SSAA version. And there's also going to be um, a, a two-part version. So, so there's, there's gonna be 20 pieces altogether. I have my work cut out for me um, over the next, um, the next 40 days. I mean, don't worry, the, the pieces are well underway. But, um, but it still is uh, a tall task, um, but one I'm just greatly excited about. Um, the pieces are going, to, they are very different from each other. Um, there's some slow movements, there's some dissonance in it. Um, none of them are too difficult because I understand that choirs are performing this virtually. And I do want you know, the, the choirs uh, that are part of this to feel um, not only that they're you know, part of the journey of you know, of, of, of the discovery of the subject matter behind it, but I also want them to feel a good amount of success in their performance, whether it's virtually um, or, whether it's, um, or whether it's live, uh, which, you know, hopefully by April, May, you know, uh, maybe choirs will be able to be back in person, um, you know, but of course some, some might decide to hold off and, you know, do the, the you know, all, all five pieces um, in, in the fall. I will mention this now and I'll mention it later. Um, to join this consortium, um, a choir need only pay $150. I reduced the fee greatly because uh, when I launched this, it was uh, right before the pandemic. I know that there are a lot of choral organizations out there that are struggling financially. Funding has dried up. A lot of organizations lost their spring concerts um, and um, that, that hit hard. So, um, you know, I, I still wanted to afford the opportunity for every choir. I, I didn't want um, finances to get in the way of, you know, um, participation. And that's, I think that's a good reason why we have 29 choirs um, that are part of this already. Um, and actually it's more than that. I think it's 31 because uh, two uh, choir directors joined. Um, uh, they, they paid two fees to have two separate choirs as part of this as well. So um, anyway, but we do have room for 21 more choirs altogether. Um, and that is, uh, that's where we're at right now. Every choir, like I said, every choir has a chance to, um, to have a schedule a Zoom session uh, with myself and Chantel. Our hours are pretty flexible, so it really hasn't been that much of a challenge to schedule those. The real interesting part of this, if that's not already the interesting part, is what the choirs are doing right now, because all these choirs joined, right? 
music's not ready until January. So, so what happens between now and January? So what happens between now and January? Is, so what happens in the fall? Um, in this case, the choirs that have already joined have made this into two seasons. They, they have in the fall, the, the journey towards the commission, the discovery. I've made a series of videos with my panel, my group of experts, so to speak, um, not so to speak, they are. Um, and we had these fabulous discussions uh, about the photos of Hugh Mangum, kind of leaving out an important element here. Um, this is all based on the photos of Hugh Mangum, who was a photographer from the turn of the century, um, from, the, from the 19th to the 20th century. He was a photographer in, based in uh, Durham, North Carolina during the Jim Crow era. And what's beautiful, beautiful about his photos, he would go around from town to town and he would set up his virtual, oh, not virtual, sorry, I'm in the wrong century here. He would set up his uh, makeshift studios in different parts of uh, the area in North Carolina and he would put up signs and flyers and, and people would come and they would, um, they would have their portraits taken. So let's just take a look here. I'm going to share this setting. So right now you're taking a look at these gorgeous photos. These photos were actually um, abandoned um, probably shortly after his death. Um, he died, um, I believe it was in the late 19, like around 1918, 19, or it might've been in the 1920s. Um, let me take a quick peek here. And uh, yeah, it was in the 1920s he died. He had a young age, actually. Um, a lot of these photos were abandoned. They were actually um, left in, in on a shelf in, in a barn. Um, and they were rediscovered decades later. And um, as you can see, as you, as you take a look at these photos, they, a lot of these photos are damaged from the, from the time that they spent in the barn. Um, but it sets this... Um, this beauty to uh, the photos too. Um, there's, you know, there's there's this um, closeness to the people who are posing, and the more you discover, the more you talk about it, as we do in the panels and um, as we do in the videos, and as we sit and discover them, um, we we get closer to them. But there's also this distance um, because they were from, you know, um, hundred years ago, and because of the as you can see with this one, uh, you know, uh, one of the eyes is covered with um, damage and, um, you know, uh, but there's, there's such a beauty to the hairstyles and, and the hats and, and the clothing. And, um, and we talk about culture and what it was like um, during the Jim Crow era, um, what it was like to actually, um, you know, in this, ver this age of, of terrifying hostility, that there was this safe harbor in Hugh Mangum studio where um, whether you were black or white, uh, whether you were rich or poor, um, you stood in line, you waited for your turn and you came in and you got your photo taken. Um, and that was unusual for uh, a time when there was so much segregation. Um, he definitely needed to go around the local laws um, in order to be able to make this happen. So, so Hugh Mangum um, basically in a beautiful way and intentionally in a way, but also the art has created itself in, in this new, more beautiful way, in a sense of the fact that he, he didn't intend for us to discover these 100 years from now as a collection. So the art that we see in it, the beauty that we see in it um, now is a different layer even because we're looking at these as, you know, in its entirety. These photos were meant for loved ones. These photos were, were taken, um, you know, uh, the beautiful lighting that he used, the, you know, just to, to you know, um, respect every single skin tone um, that came into his, you know, his studio. Um, the, the way that he allowed them to, to be themselves. Um, he didn't, as, a, as, a, as an artist or, you know, as a photographer, he didn't instill his ideas. He brought out the beauty in each person for how they wanted to express themselves. Well, each one speaks beautifully to an individual um, expressing themselves, but collectively, this is where uh, we now view these collectively, there is a beauty to um, these photos um, as a whole, you know? So because of the fact that he provided this safe harbor, um, you know, and because we have a collection of his photos, there is this um, layer of, 
um, understanding how he subverted the narrative. You know, if we had just had one photo, we might have looked at that and found it beautiful. There's Margaret and Alex, who are the editors, the photographers and the editors. Um, yeah, Ronald, to imagine that they were so thrilled to be remembered in a captured memory. Absolutely, you know, um, if, you know, if these these pieces, these these photos were um, for many of these individuals were the only photo that they had in in their life taken of them, you know, or one of few. Um, so it was really important to them. You could see how people dressed up, um, you know, either they had, you know, uh, either either they were from wealth. Um, there was, um, you know, uh, wealth in Durham, North Carolina, both in the um, in, in the white community, but also in Haytai in the business district um, of uh, the black community, which was a middle-class community in Durham, North Carolina. Um, and um, so either they had, you know, nice clothes, you could tell in some series of photos there that it comes from a rather wealthier area. Um, but then there's others that maybe just had that one special outfit that they wore to church, which you know, church, especially in the black community, offered a dignity and a respect that they did not get. It was another safe harbor, um, a dignity and respect that they did not get in the dominant society outside of the black community and that, you know, the area that they lived in. Um, so church was something that was really important to the culture. And, um, you know, there, there was, uh, you dressed up when you went to church, you call people by their last name, which was again, another um, dignity that was given, you know, in the church community that wasn't afforded in the outside community. Um, these are all things that we discussed with our panel. Um, a wonderful panel. I'm going to go back to the panelists now and let's take a look at them. Okay, so there I am at the beginning. I'm the composer and Tina Sayers is um, the, uh, she's the executive director of Maple Seed Creative Consulting. She's the one that wrote the co-curriculum for those choirs that are part of a high school or a middle school um, that would like to um, collaborate with the, the history department um, or the language arts department or the art department. Uh, we have co-curriculum written for that. And she also put those beautiful photos that you saw um, on that website uh, so that anybody that's part of either my virtual choir, because I am organizing a virtual choir as well, or um, those that have whatever choirs, it could be a community choir, a college choir, um, a high school choir, all of those, they can then go view the photos if they can't individually you know, buy the book. Alex and Margaret, Margaret is a writer. I thought she was a photographer first, but her writing is just so beautiful. Um, she uh, is a Duke University instructor and Alex is um, Duke University Emeritus Professor of, of the Practice and a photographer as well. And they're the ones that curated the uh, exhibit. Um, they are the featured guests in, uh, along with Dr. Boyd. Um, they are the featured guests of these panels. Um, they speak beautifully about photography, about art in, in general, about subverting the narrative, about the culture that they discovered through you know, the years of exploring these photos and setting up the display. Um, and then Dr. Boyd uh, came on board. She's the humanities coordinator for Dallas College. Um, and her insights um, is, are just so incredibly important and powerful. And Sh Sh uh, Chantel uh, Sellers is my lyricist, uh, my dear friend who I've uh, worked with on a number of projects. Uh, those of you that are in Women's Voices Chorus got to experience her lyrics uh, when we put together Only Time to Love, the Choral Consortium Reading Girl. Uh, those lyrics are just so incredibly powerful. We had such a positive feedback from the choruses, the treble choruses that sang in uh, the Radium Girl. We've done a number of projects together. Joe Ort uh, commissioned uh, me and Chantel to uh, write a piece that his choir performed up in the Eastern ACDA conference. That was actually the week before uh, New York State was shut down for the pandemic um, and oh, such a beautiful performance. Um, so anyway, so we've worked uh, quite often and quite frequently together. Um, and uh, that's because she's an incredible lyricist to work with, lyricist to work with. So this is the book that um, when I was at this exhibit a year and a half ago, when I was uh, down in Durham, North Carolina, my uh, host, the person who was, um, who was hosting me, um, brought me to the museum the National Museum at Duke University. And the first photo that I saw actually was of Hugh. Here's Hugh. 
looking over his hat, kind of mystery. There's a mystery behind. Well, what is what is the expression behind you know his his hat, um, and and what is he hiding? And um, you know, this is kind of this encapsulates like when we when we sit here and we look at these photos, there is a mystery. We don't ever really know these people. Actually, Margaret and Alex did find the history of a few of the people, the sitters, um, through their you know sleuthing and their detective work. They were able to discover you know stories of families. But a lot of these people, we don't know like what was really going on in their lives, and we can only guess based on clues. And the panel discussions, the videos that you watch with your choirs are uh, just really interesting as to like what they were able to discover. Once what Chantel was able to discover through her understanding of um, clothing and fabrics and, and all this, you know, because she's done a lot of this research uh, as an author for her own books. What uh, Dr. Boyd, what, what Cherry was able to, um, to share about the black culture, the black community and what they were going through right after the, the civil war, right at, after the end of slavery and how that affected them. I would love to actually um, share, all the videos are password protected, but I think I will share one tonight. And this is, the full length video of Hair uh, has 31 views so far. Um, those are from the choirs that were participating. Here is special exclusive access to uh, the full length video of Hair. A lot of these videos are actually chopped and not chopped in half, but um, have highlight uh, reels. But let me take you to a live quick view of the pages. So uh, basically uh, information, well, here's the protected page that um, my virtual choir has access to and the, uh, all the choirs of the consortium have access to. As you can see, there's study guides. There's a link to the study guides. I'll quickly click on that and then I'll click back. And you could see the home page is this. Um, you could see a link to buy the book because the book is tremendous. They have a sale right now also, uh, at least they did a few days ago. There's art, there's photography, there's American history, language arts, and then Hugh Mangum's portraits. So you click on here and you get straight to Hugh Mangum's portraits, which um, are on a three second advance. And you can actually change that to make it every five seconds or 10 seconds or whatever. And you could share that with your choir, or if you're part of the virtual choir, you could look at them yourself. So here's video one called hair. And so when we talk about the different hairstyles, we talk about the significance of hair very fascinating conversation about hair. In fact, to those of you that have Netflix, Madam C.J. Walker was a very significant you know, um, person in the Black community for her hair products. Sherry talks uh, at length about that, um, which I thought was interesting, and how you know, uh, a couple of the people who were photographed uh, in this uh, might have actually been influenced by Madam C.J. Walker's um, products. Video two, again, we have panel highlights, part one and part two, which are smaller versions or shorter versions of the full length panel discussion. Uh, the, the highlight versions are good for um, high school and middle school groups because they might not necessarily stick to watching a full hour length video um, of adults talking about these topics. Um, although they're, they're, they're full of really interesting ideas, I think that um, you know the highlights break it down a little bit more. Uh, video three is scars. Scars in the fact that there was a different type of medicine back then. There was a different type of, um, you know, uh, medical community um, scars. And also there were a lot of scars from the fact that the Civil War just ended, um, you know, uh, a generation ago. Um, and so slavery didn't end with the Civil War. There were other forms of slavery um, that, uh, that existed um, in other names. You better believe that you know these communities were aware of convict leasing and and stuff like that, uh, in which inmates were uh, or you know people were convicted of crimes um, and uh, you know sometimes that was uh, intentional just to um, just to get more of a workforce uh, of a slave labor workforce. Um, there's an interesting you know um, whole entire history, a very tragic and traumatic history of what happened after slavery. Um, in the Black community and um, how slavery continued to exist in other forms and other names. And then uh, the video four is Memento Favere. As you saw before, I think, is that there will be more videos. I'm working on the video called Jim Crow and Racism. Um, that'll be coming out pretty soon. Um, and then, of course, you'll have the live session with me and a few other videos. So if you are a choir that's interested in joining the Where We Find Ourselves Commissioning Consortium, 
Um, here is the link to join. This is through Paul Rudoy's uh, consortia. Part of the reason why I'm taking uh, up to 50 choirs, but no more than 50 choirs, is the fact that I am redoing this at a reduced price. So um, I, I am hoping that if you know a choir, if you could share this with them, that would be great. 50 choirs brings me closer to um, a professional fee as a commissioned composer, but also because I decided to bring in panelists, obviously, um, you know, uh, those that, um, that also need to be paid, um, you know, are, are paid properly as well. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, please share with other choirs. And same thing with my virtual choir. Uh, we could definitely use more singers. We have a nice little group together. Um, I'm going to make, be making myself, I'm going to be making a virtual performance um, out of everybody's recordings. You will get practice. Uh, rehearsal recordings for you to practice with and to record with. Um, and so uh, please feel free to check out my virtual choir uh, in which we will perform the SATB version of where we find ourselves all five movements. Again, these are four minutes each, uh, about four minutes each. So we're talking about 20 to 22 minutes worth of music, but it's not going to be um, inaccessible. It'll be accessible and I would love to have you. I am so happy that you were able to join me. Thank you so much. Um, and I hope everybody has a fantastic night.